Try now. Yes, now it works. Okay. I'm a software engineer in, at Red Hat. I work on virtualization. Uh, usually work on the lower levels of the virtualization stack, but as you will see, we'll talk about everything low level, high level. For there's room for for everyone's tastes in virtualization. Uh, I will shortly talk about what made KVM successful, what came out of it, what kind of ecosystem developed around it, and how do you use this ecosystem. And then at the end, the end, I have a short uh, overview of what will. Uh, be the next features perhaps in 2012 in KVM and Libvirt and all the other pieces of the open source virtualization stack. So this is a famous message, not as famous as the one from Linux, but kind of. It says the following patch set adds a driver for Intel's hardware virtualization extensions to the x86 architecture. And uh, from this message, we can actually see already Mm, three, two, three uh, characteristics that made KVM successful. And none of these uh, is a, an obvious thing. Each of these is a precise ingredient of KVM success. It, it focuses on future hardware. Uh, at, at the time uh, this was written in 2006, most virtualization was done uh, either by paravirtualization, like Zen, or by binary translation uh, like VMware. Instead, uh, uh, these are both complicated uh, pieces of technology. Instead, what KVM did was focusing exclusively on uh, hardware-assisted virtualization, which actually, if you can use it, has the best uh, performance and uh, the simplest code in the hypervisor. Of course, the point was that no servers at the time supported virtualizations, or almost. But this was going to change, of course, in the next years. So this was a precise design point, and uh, it allowed uh, Avi and the team to, to write KVM in less than two months. The second part is that he says, each virtual machine is a process on the host, the virtual CPU is a thread in that process, and kill nice top work as expected. This uh, uh, is another uh, feature of KVM, it re reuses the whole Linux kernel infrastructure. Again, this is not obvious because what happens if you start doing KVM and it works great as a proof of concept and then the scheduler doesn't scale enough for KVM or it turns out that perhaps uh, you need different uh, tuning, different tweaking of the parameters for virtual machines and you just go slow. And the third part is every signature and uh, a third feature of KVM is that it has a witty maintainer that is also a very nice person to speak with. So, uh, looks like mm, it's very good to have uh, these three things uh, and uh, a nice, a, mm, a good hacker that can uh, write solid code quickly for a proof of concept, but are you sure that you can productize uh, these things. Uh, how, wi how willing are you to bet on the quick adoption of new hardware with the virtualization extension? And how much are you willing to bet on your ability to integrate with uh, Linux kernel development? Uh, and uh, how much are you willing to bet on your ability to, cr to create a community around your project when you're just working on the bottom layer, the hypervisor within the kernel? So these three were the main uh, uh, things that the, the main three challenges that KVM faced, and apparently it was very successful in all three of them. Now, KVM maintainer's life is quite tough, as you can see, because you, you constantly have to face trade-offs and uh, to find the best way to uh, trade off KVM's uh, functionality in, as a hypervisor and Linux's functionality as a general purpose operating system. So, do you integrate uh, with uh, the kernel or not? Actually, with the kernel, uh, there's no, really no choice. Uh, the Linux community is the Linux community. Mm, you cannot change it because it's big and it can be a bit unfriendly. Sorry, first mistake, slide six. Uh, so, uh, it can be a bit unfriendly. 
And uh, KVM cannot fork the kernel because KVM is not Android. KVM is just a piece of an enterprise uh, Linux distribution, for example. Mm, it's not uh, controlling the whole operating system as it, you have it installed uh, on, a, on a cell phone. So what uh, Avi and uh, the team at Kumranet did was to start with a quick and painless integration of, uh, of KVM in the kernel, and then uh, get in the features later slowly. This was actually quite successful, and uh, a good way to make it successful is to follow the golden rule of contributing uh, to the Linux kernel, which is to not drop things uh, in one single shot. You just slip it slowly in small increments, and uh, for each step, you must justify to Linux that it's actually a cool thing to have, and you're not crazy and caring just about uh, your use case. Every patch that you contribute to Linux must look obviously good at first sight. Not easy, but at least you, you have an idea of what to do. Uh, the other major piece of KVM was the client, the program that actually uses K the KVM services from the kernel. And uh, integration with KVM was a much less important task. In this respect, uh, mm, you can actually afford using uh, a fork, mm, because QMU is really used only by KVM, unlike the, the kernel. In fact, even nowadays, uh, uh, on x86, you usually use KVM uh, with the QMU KVM binary, which is uh, a fork. There are still several features that are only implemented by QMU KVM and not by upstream QMU. And uh, to do this sanely, you do basically three things. Uh, you work as much as possible with upstream. You don't want to come with a code drop that upstream will uh, reject and that, that has no way to get integrated. You mm, periodically try to get your stuff upstream, and uh, you merge regularly from what you're forking from. And this is taking quite a while to resolve, uh, but uh, nowadays we have 7,000 lines of code uh, from QMU KVM that are waiting to be merged into the project that QMU KVM forked from. 7,000 can be a lot, can be little, depends on your taste. Uh, the important thing is that they are all relatively easy things to, to manage. All the difficult parts, the ones that were causing uh, troublesome merge conflicts and constant pain whenever you were merging from upstream, all those are now merged, and there's only painless uh, things waiting to be merged. So in particular, let's see these crazy features that Linux accepted in the kernel. Uh, there, there are basically some kind of hooks uh, from the general purpose uh, kernel components to uh, KVM. In the scheduler in particular, which lets uh, KVM switch from the guest to the kernel and back to the guest, in a very lightweight way. And instead, uh, if you are, are uh, switching from the guest to another process, you go through the whole uh, heavyweight context switching. Uh, there is notifiers in the memory management subsystem. Notifiers, basically, you can call them hooks, if you prefer. And this uh, is what allows, for example, KVM to uh, have uh, overcommitted memory and um, to swap uh, guest memory to disk. Uh, also in the memory management uh, area, an important feature is uh, merging of pages that uh, are from different guests but have the same contents. Typical example is Windows. Windows always f uh, zeros page, uh, pages that are free in the background. If you free a page, uh, uh, Windows tries to turn it to zeros before uh, giving it back to, to another uh, process, and this is because it saves time. It would have to zero it anyway. But this also means that uh, all the pages that are free along, uh, across 20 Windows guests, they, are all, they all have the same contents and they all can be merged together into a single uh, page. And this is very important uh, when overcommitting uh, memory for Windows guests. Another one, probably the most important, I think, 
it's transparent to huge pages. Uh, we used to use uh, pages that are four kilobyte in size when memory was 60 megabytes, 32 megabytes, 64 megabytes. Nowadays, memory is at least on the kind of machines that run KVM, at least two gigabytes. Sometimes you have, you are more in the range of 64 or 128 gigabytes of memory even. And you are still accessing them, those memory uh, pages in 4K chunks. Transparent huge pages actually uh, let you allow access mm, the memory in uh, two megabyte chunks. And uh, it's a very good speed up for, um, for virtualization, but it's also a very good speed up in general. Uh, it can actually speed up uh, spec, mm, spec benchmarks on Java benchmarks uh, by five or 10 percent. And that's not something that you, you have very often, that a single feature contributes five or 10 per or 10 percent mm, performance improvement. Also in QEMU, there, there are some interesting features that were contributed uh, from KVM. Migration of uh, virtual machines, uh, support for uh, multiprocessor guests, uh, uh, support for having stable guest hardware. You don't add uh, a, a disk and then suddenly all uh, your uh, hardware has changed, has changed PCI addresses and what used to be SDA becomes SDC and uh, so on. Uh, this is very important for sanity, but also again for uh, Windows guests, for example. You avoid that you have to reactivate the guests just because uh, you, you added uh, one disk. And also, uh, since, uh, as we'll see later, QAM is just the bottom piece of the user space stack, it's also important to have a sane interface from QAM to the rest of the stack. And uh, this kind of uh, RPC from the virtual machine monitor to the upper stack mm, is w one feature that was contributed by KVM developers to QMU. And of course, the number one feature that was contributed to QMU is support for KVM itself, because it can easily speed up execution of uh, virtual machines uh, by five or 10 times. I mean, QMU itself is a hypervisor. KVM is just an accelerator. Uh, the big part of, uh, of QM was actually reused uh, when running uh, KVM guests. And actually, the, mm, this is the number one feature of KVM. As I said before, it's simple. It does nothing. It only runs the VM for you. There is no policy decision that is part of uh, KVM's business. Uh, KVM doesn't know if you identify virtual machines by a number, by a UUID, or uh, whatever. KVM, for KVM, a CPU is a thread, and uh, a virtual machine is a process. That's it. KVM does no security checks. KVM does no memory management, no scheduling, mm, tries to do nothing about uh, NUMA machines, for example. All of this is done by the kernel. It's not just... Uh, a decision that saves development time, it also gives uh, uh, enormous flexibility and uh, you can use KVM however you want. So, uh, all together, let's see, these are the mm, ingredients of KVM success. It was built entirely around the components itself. Everybody could uh, tinker with it, download it, uh, play, contribute patches, uh, uh, report bugs, uh, and so on. Uh, it didn't just use uh, these open source products as foundations. It also successfully contributed back uh, major new features to both. Uh, KVM stimulated the growth of a large and uh, open community around open source virtualization. And uh, it enabled the creation of a large software ecosystem that uh, contributes literally dozens of uh, major products and a lot of uh, people that are just uh, using KVM just to learn things, uh, to, to do things the, the open source way, the free software way. And another important thing is that KVM's uh, success has both technical factors, 
uh, good design choices and good hackers working on it, and social factors, such as actually uh, not being just good hackers, but also being able to stimulate other people to work uh, on your project and work with you on your project. And I think this is a big thing for uh, uh, open source. The technical factors and the social factors are not separate. Uh, what you need to do is to create a virtuous cycle where the technical factors and the social factors reinforce each other. So, uh, to sum up, you may think that here is how you use KVM. You just have this QMU binary and you invoke it, of course. And we have a virtual print machine. Unfortunately, there is some fine print. This is how you actually <laughs> start the virtual machine. So, when you use Zen, you have the Zen hypervisor, you have uh, Zen DOM zero, you have all these components, and you have a rich environment of tools that build upon the hypervisor. Now, KVM gives you all this flexibility, so you can actually just run your virtual machine with QMU, but it's not really the perfect way to use KVM. So you need something up there. And this something is libvirt. The goal of libvirt, as taken from the website, is to provide a common and stable layer sufficient to securely manage domains on a node and possibly manage them remotely. In practice, this means that libvirt provides an API to, to manage domains locally and remotely, and actually not just domain, also storage, network, and all components of the uh, virtual machine. It also provides a daemon that uh, handles remote communication, configures the server to run virtual the virtual machine, and also uh, it sits above QEMU and uh, handles the life cycle of the virtual machine, uh, start uh, virtual machine, stop it, migrate it, uh, and so on. Uh, it was started around the end of 2006, and um, it supported KVM uh, and Zen around uh, June, say, let's say, 2007. So what you do is this. You have um, Zen with its own family of tools, and you have KVM with QM, and Libvirt can talk to both. And uh, you have tools such as Virch, which is a um, small command line shell, and Virt Manager, which is a graphic user interface. And uh, uh, Virch and Virt Manager talk to Libvirt, uh, Libvirt talks to QMU, and QMU uses the hypervisor support in the kernel. Actually, Libvirt grew nicely, and uh, it doesn't support only KVM and Zen. It supports Hyper-V, it supports CSX. Both of these are proprietary solutions, but you can manage them the same way as Zen or KVM guests. It supports uh, Linux containers, it supports user mode Linux, and a bunch of others. So, mm, with Libvirt, you can uh, manage uh, all of these hypervisors, and Libvirt can both talk to other open source hypervisors, talk to proprietary hypervisors, or talk to QEMU, which is kind of a different way to manage a virtual machine. This is what Libvirt does. It manages the host, which is a big thing to do. You have to start and stop virtual machines, of course, but also manage the virtual networks, uh, manage bridges, manage uh, IP tables to do net uh, of uh, a private network for the virtual machine. Uh, you can use more uh, high-end uh, equipment, which is pretty complicated even to explain and to understand. Same for storage. You can just work on um, a local disk. You can work uh, on an image that, that is stored on the network via NFS, or you can use uh, high-end fiber channel, uh, sun, and so on. Uh, another major component uh, of Libvirt is that it provides the isolation between the virtual machine and the host uh, in case something goes wrong or Libvirt tries to make it go not too wrong, not badly wrong. Uh, compromised virtual machines uh, uh, need to be prevented uh, from accessing other VMs or even worse, escalating to the host and do nasty things on the host's uh, network. Uh, you might well have uh, a, a 
virtual machine that is facing the public network and the host that is not facing the public network. And you need to avoid uh, that a compromise of a public uh, facing virtual machine reaches the uh, private network and your DMZ. So libvirt provides containment in case the hypervisor security is breached. And uh, this is uh, based mostly on uh, SE Linux and uh, C groups. And it works, works particularly well on KVM because all that you do uh, with uh, SE Linux and C groups uh, in KVM can uh, be, uh, be applied to the QMU process and uh, through the QMU process to the VM. There are several users of, of libvirt. Virt Manager uh, was the first graphical user interface that was written for libvirt. It, uh, it is pretty comprehensive. There is another one that's called Boxes that is being worked by the GNOME guys. And uh, it's more, uh, uh, fa it's more for uh, actually people doing desktop virtualization, like using virtual machines on uh, really just for dual, instead of dual booting basically. But a major part of libvirt clients is uh, other APIs that libvirt provides. Uh, you can access uh, domain information or in general libvirt information via SNMP, via AMQP, which is a message queue protocol uh, uh, that you can run and send uh, information for uh, monitoring the host from elsewhere via Matahari. And uh, there's also an open standard to describe guest resource pools uh, and so on. Uh, Libvirt works heavily with uh, XML documents, and this CIM is the open standard that provides an abstraction on um, guest and resource pools that can actually replace these uh, XML documents. There are also low-level APIs uh, that wrap uh, Libvirt uh, using glib and gobject. They provide basically an alternative API that can be more easily then wrapped again in uh, Python, uh, Ruby, and so on, JavaScript, uh, using G-Object introspection. And there's also a, in this family of glib, G-Object-based uh, libraries, there is libvirt gconfig, which is an, an API to abstract the libvirt uh, XML schemas. Mm, and uh, other libvirt clients are uh, command line tools. Uh, virt install uh, is uh, um, basically a command line program to provision virtual machines and DOS is part of uh, Eolus. Eolus is uh, an, an open source project. Uh, it's mostly for managing clouds and managing virtual machines that are running not on your own um, servers but rather on a cloud. Um, and uh, actually as part of Eolus there is OZ, and OZ is another uh, virtual machine installer that much more uh, complete than virt install and more powerful. And two other tools that are not uh, uh, based on libvirt but very useful and also talk to QMU in the same ways are libguestfs and the command line uh, interface which is called guestfish. And uh, they are uh, lib useful to inspect virtual machines, uh, uh, gather information from the disks, uh, and so on. So this is uh, how the KVM, uh, a KVM host lo looks like. It has KVM, QM, libvirt uh, with all those providers above. And it has libguestfs that can be used via guestfish or with uh, Fuse, you can just mount your virtual machine images on the host. So uh, the libvirt ones uh, can be used locally and remotely. And this is very important as we go to the next step. Is this really how you use KVM with virt manager? Virt manager can manage, in theory, also the remote part uh, using libvirt. But it doesn't really do that very well. When your challenge is to manage tens of thousands of virtual machines and make each of it accessible from hundreds of or thousands of nodes and hundreds or thousands of thin clients on the other side. 
Basically, what libvirt does is to provide a host agent. Uh, it, as I said before, it manages the storage, it manages the network, it manages the life cycle of the VM, and it manages uh, security. But actually, when you have a large-scale virtualization, you have many of these host agents, and you need some kind of management engine that takes care of a lot more things. Uh, it must take, ca take care about uh, creating the VMs and provisioning them, uh, migrating them, uh, in case a node has to go down uh, and you need to migrate the virtual machine to another node, bring down the node for maintenance, or uh, when one node is almost empty but not really, you may want to migrate again to another node so that you can save power. On the other way, if a virtual machine suddenly starts having a huge spike of uh, activity, you may want to migrate other virtual machines to other nodes in order to keep the load nicely balanced across the cluster. Uh, you have done all these activities uh, about mm, with all these nodes, and you actually want to provide uh, uh, a report of what problems uh, arrived and uh, how they were solved and so on. And also the storage must be managed uh, not only for each single uh, node, but if you are uh, actually running on, on uh, a SAN, uh, you need also some kind of management uh, across them, the whole uh, cluster. And also you need uh, uh, something that runs in the guest, also for monitoring purposes, uh, but also for nicer integration with uh, the host, for example, providing single sign-on, and also to respond to management actions of course, you cannot expect collaboration from the guest, but you can at least try. For example, you can ask the, the guest to hibernate uh, instead of doing a non-live migration. There are several solutions for this uh, with kind of different uh, aims. Um, there's OpenStack uh, that is probably the one that you have uh, heard of if you were in the cloud uh, dev room this morning. And uh, actually, OpenStack uh, is a relatively new project. There is another project that's called Open Nebula. And uh, I think the talk about Open Nebula is concurrent with this one, so you are missing it. Um, and uh, both Open Nebula and OpenStack uh, are more targeted ab about mm, providing a cloud uh, and letting your users run virtual machines on, on your cloud. Uh, there's Ganetti and Guido talked about it before. So it has a very interesting focus on, uh, on replicated storage that is pretty much unique to, to it, even though it's coming uh, in both OpenStack and Ovirt. And Ovirt is the last one. And uh, the interesting feature of Ovirt is that it provides a very complete uh, uh, administration uh, uh, interface uh, where you can actually manage thousands of virtual machines on hundreds of nodes and uh, assign net storage to each of the virtual machines and so on. Wow, this is ugly. Uh, so as you can see, most of them have roughly the same features. Uh, ONE stands for Open Nebula, and NOVA stands for OpenStack Compute. Some of them are lacking. Uh, for example, Nova, at least now, doesn't have support for uh, live migration, and uh, Ovirt doesn't yet have support for replicated storage, even though it's in the works. Open Nebula doesn't have support for uh, replicated storage out of the box, but actually people are using DRBD uh, very effectively with it. Uh, many of them support uh, other hypervisors than KVM, uh, usually using libvirt, though not necessarily. Uh, Ovirt, as far as I know, is the only one to provide uh, a guest agent. And Ovirt also is special in that it provides uh, a specialized uh, distro that is very small and runs on uh, the nodes. Ovirt, uh, um, I'm going to focus in particular on Ovirt uh, right now. Uh, it's uh, an open platform for virtualizing your data center. 
And uh, it's a large project that comprises a lot of um, uh, different pieces of the stack. Uh, development of Ovirt started at Kumranet, which is the startup mm, where uh, KVM was created. Ovirt is the basis of uh, Red Hat uh, Enterprise Virtualization 3. And uh, it's backed not only by Red Hat, but uh, for also by those companies on the slide. Uh, this is Ovirt. It has all the components that were in the previous slide, the engine, uh, something running on the node, and uh, a guest agent. The engine uh, is uh, the part that you actually use, the part that you actually talk to. You can talk to it uh, with a REST API, you can talk to it uh, via a command line, uh, or uh, also there is an SDK if you want to completely drop the uh, administration portals and write your own, and there are people that are doing it and doing uh, really nice things with it. Uh, the node uh, is called VDSM. It uses uh, libvirt. It's written in Python, and it's nice because it's very small. It can run uh, in less than 100 megabytes of installed uh, disk space. And the guest agent takes care of single sign-on and managing the clipboard and passing the clipboard to the thin client, for example. And it supports both Linux and Windows. The most important uh, component, of course, is the, the engine. And there will be plenty of talks uh, on all the components and especially the engine tomorrow in the dev room. Uh, VDSM uh, is the most interesting to me, at least, because uh, it's what actually runs uh, on uh, the host, and it's the part that really, in the end, uh, talks to the code that I write. So <laughs> VDSM uh, is a libvirt client, though it doesn't use libvirt for everything. It uses libvirt mostly for uh, uh, starting uh, the virtual machine and talking to QEMU. And um, what v VDSM does, uh, basically, is to provide uh, and a high-level uh, API that can be used by the Overt engine. Uh, and uh, it's VDSM that uh, is asked to migrate virtual machines and so on whenever all those actions for uh, power saving, load balancing, and so on take place. Uh, VDSM is able to manage various kinds of uh, storage, and it has some very nice features for team provisioning, even though th these are probably the place where the, mm, open source virtualization is still lacking compared to proprietary solutions. The things that are in Overt are already quite nice. And uh, it provides also the monitoring engine for monitoring both the host and uh, the guests. And uh, of course, it, since it's actually the part that runs on the same uh, Host, physical host as the guest agent, it talks to it as much as possible and attempts to provide an integrated uh, experience for the user of a remote desktop. So there are still a lot of things to do. Uh, there are still uh, a lot of things to, uh, a lot of gaps to close, uh, but we are getting there and we are getting there uh, fast. Uh, one uh, interesting feature uh, of um, of the Ovirt engine was that it was written in C-sharp. It used to be written in C-sharp, and it required a, virtual m a Windows uh, machine to run it, a virtual and uh, it still requires kind of a virtual machine, a Windows uh, machine to, to actually administer the, um, the virtual machines. W we have uh, a new user interface that uh, removes uh, the last piece of Windows dependency, the whole uh, application was partly rewritten, partly converted from C sharp, from, uh, C -sharp to Java. Uh, and uh, also the new uh, web user interface uh, will be more powerful than the old one and will uh, have uh, reporting uh, integrated into the user interface. Uh, right now the API is mostly to create virtual machines, not really to use them. So another important part that will come soon is uh, to create a public API, not just uh, a REST API, but also a, um, a um, 
programming uh, interface for, uh, for the users of the engine. And also, uh, I was saying before about uh, that still there is no support uh, for uh, distributed storage, and this is going to change with uh, added support for ClusterFS. And uh, there's a lot of work to do not only on the engine, but actually at all levels of the, uh, of the stack. Uh, VDSM is going uh, to add support for live snapshot, live storage migration, uh, sharing disks between uh, virtual machines uh, so that you can have a cluster made of virtual machines. Um, adding backups, really, storage is mm, a, mm, an area where there is a lot of work going on at all levels of the stack. Another interesting point uh, is uh, service level agreements. It's something that can be done uh, very nicely using C groups uh, under Linux, and uh, using these features in VDSM is going to come soon. Uh, Overt node uh, only supports Fedora right now, uh, actually a custom spin of Fedora. Uh, and uh, going to they're going to add support for uh, additional distributions. I, I think the first will be OpenSUSE. I don't know if Debian derivatives are coming. Uh, Libvirt uh, uh, is a major uh, part uh, of the virtualization stack because it's where the integration with the operating system actually happens. And um, Major new features in Libvirt space will be fine-grained access control, so that for every tuple of uh, a user working on a given object and doing uh, something to that object, uh, for each such tuple you will be able to say yes, no, uh, and uh, actually get mm, this kind of access control mm, is useful also for uh, to avoid breaches and, uh, and improve containment. Uh, SE Linux, as I said before, right now is mostly a KVM feature, but it can be applied uh, very well at least to LXC. And uh, uh, adding confinement to LXC is very important for sandboxing. Uh, a very nice way to run a sandboxed uh, application is to just make it the only application running on a virtual machine. Uh, you can do it with KVM virtual machine or you can do it with LXC. Both of them have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, for networking, uh, OpenV switch uh, is something that was mm, kind of network bridging on steroids that was merged into the Linux kernel and uh, uh, Support, uh, adding support uh, to Libvirt uh, is important because it can add many features and uh, ma many uh, kinds of isolation uh, and communication uh, mechanisms between uh, virtual machines. And also, with we, we are getting uh, network cards that are more and more powerful. Some of them are actually are have a pool of even 64 uh, uh, Ethernet port on them. and. Uh, uh, getting this uh, usable in practice because managing manually 64 uh, virtual network cards is impossible. So mm, improving support for SRIOV is a major uh, part of what is coming to Libvirt. And finally, Libvirt will, uh, to some extent, uh, take care itself of communicating uh, with the guest agents. Uh, most clients of Libvirt are using it, especially for uh, virtual machine lifecycle, and uh, asking uh, the guest uh, to suspend uh, or hibernate is uh, important to, to have uh, a smooth uh, handling of the lifecycle. Going down in the layer, mm, the next layer is, uh, is QEMU. Again, storage is a major uh, uh, piece uh, of where development is going, going on. Uh, I personally am working uh, on a, a virtualized SCSI controller. Uh, there are many advantages of having a, a virtualized SCSI controller device rather than just a disk. Uh, the main one uh, is that uh, there are, well, very simplifying, there are 
smaller differences between what a virtual machine, what hardware a virtual machine sees and what hardware uh, the same machine running on bare metal sees. They will both see SCSI disks and uh, the smaller the difference is, the easier the management. Also supporting theme provisioning, live storage migration and everything in the previous slides is, has to be done first of all in QM and then can be done in Livert VDSM and so on. Another interesting thing uh, uh, in QM is that w mm, the object model uh, uh, of devices, uh, disks, uh, networks interface uh, and so on is going to be unified and uh, this will provide a simpler management interface, a simpler RPC and uh, get improvements for uh, hot plugs. And further down, uh, KVM is also going to, to have uh, better integration with, um, with OpenVSwitch. Uh, part of the networking uh, is, uh, is done in the, um, in the kernel because uh, you can actually have very nice performance improvements by cutting out uh, user space on, uh, on network input output uh, from the form and to the guests. Uh, so OpenFi switch will provide again functionality, but there's also work on zero copy and uh, performance improvements. And uh, one nice feature that um, might be more interesting uh, to the hacker audience as opposed to the sysadmin audience is uh, virtualized performance counters that actually lets you run profiling uh, of uh, something running uh, in a virtual machine. Here are a few links uh, to projects that I mentioned uh, and uh, some others that actually I didn't mention, such as Eolus, or mentioned very briefly. Uh, and now if you have any questions, I will be glad to answer. Hello, uh, I'm Andre. I'm from uh, Ever City. We are uh, big supporters of uh, Solaris and Illumos uh, uh, projects, and we are looking to using KVM on top of Illumos kernel. And uh, I have just a quick question: Who would be the best person to speak to about improving? KVM support on top of Illumos? I guess. So the question is, uh, uh, he's interested basically in using KVM on top of Solaris. The port was done uh, uh, by the guys at Joyent. Uh, they presented it to the last KVM forum in August 2011. And he asked who to contact to get um, information on development and support and improvement. Is, it, is this right? Well, I mean, join the guys. They are interested on uh, KVM on top of Intel hardware. But uh, I was wondering if there was someone uh, within KVM on top of Linux community, community who would be uh, helpful and supportive if we had any problems with KVM on top of Illumos. OK, so uh, on well. Uh, support can be given by anyone. Most of the problems uh, will probably be in the whole stack, not just in, uh, in the kernel port. And for that, probably anyone, every development can answer it. If uh, it really resides in the kernel, only the developers can provide support. Yeah, I mean, uh, low level, low level uh, support, kind of. Low level support, only the guys who did it. So, uh, for, for example, giant guys, they are not interested in AMD support. And uh, I know that it, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. KVM on, on top of Linux works just fine on Patches AMD. Patches are welcome. I mean, uh, you write a message to a mailing list. If, they, if somebody asks, says they are interested, you can work with them. Otherwise, you have to do the work yourself. Okay, thank you. Sorry. <laughs>